So good to be with everyone. Uh, of course, we'll start immediately with our Mangala Charna. O Magyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Shtapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Prajarine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vancha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Good morning to all of you, uh, or depending upon where you're tuning in from, afternoon, evening, all of the above. Um, I thought it was so appropriate that Adi Purusha Prabhu was singing Nishringadev prayers just before this, because what is a pre Nishringadev Chaturdashi Ekadashi lecture without us speaking about one of the most key Vaishnavs, uh, key Vaishnavacharyas in our lineage, who became a Vaishnavacharya at the, the ripe age of five. Uh, and what what is what is an Akadashi lecture without us speaking about Prahlad Maharaj? So today we have to, we must speak about Prahlad Maharaj. Uh, and this kind of, I wanted to tie it all into to many many different holy days that have just passed. We had the appearance day of Janava Mata, and we also had the appearance day of. Sita Devi. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, how does this, how is this all going to tie into Prahlad Maharaj? I promise we will six degrees of separation. We'll make it all link up. But I was thinking recently about Gorgovinda Maharaj and a picture had popped up on, on social media. And I looked at the picture and I almost started to you know, you have a, a moment where you just think, oh, wow, I really like this, this photo. Uh, and then I started to scroll. And then I was remembering, I actually took a second to remember all the reasons why I liked that particular photo. Firstly, it happened to be a photo that was taken by my dad. Uh, and my dad wound up being, as he was a photojournalist, uh, he wound up being a person who took many iconic photos of Gorgovinda Marge, both in New York in the temple and in Tawako, New Jersey. And so he wound up taking a lot of photos which would later become incredibly iconic, photos that wound up being worshipped in the in the temple in Bhubaneswar that Gorgovinda Maharaj had set up. And so I wound up just taking a moment to really appreciate how incredible our first generation of devotees are, were, is, still, will always be. Uh, and I, I feel like sometimes I don't do that enough. I don't take into consideration all of the incredible, superhuman, mystical things that this first generation has done. I think sometimes as a second generation kid, we wind up falling on the side of, yeah, but when's it going to be my turn? Or, yeah, 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 they did things, but when, when, when are we going to do things? Uh, and, and even speaking with my own Guru Maharaj, I wind up finding out incredible stories of the things that the first generation has done at a tender age. And even thinking about it with my own child, I was on the phone with my sister, and she was saying, you know, 
what were like what are the things that you and I did at like 11 I was like that's true I was doing a lot at 11 and when we are in charge or are given charge of other devotees sometimes we wind up thinking oh no wait but they should be more advanced or we have to let them grow up or we have to let them reach a certain age before and then we take a second to think what was I doing at that age or what was the first generation doing at that age the first generation in their 30s they'd already set up temples they had become caretakers of deities and stewards over preaching centers uh they had traveled the world oftentimes alone they were on their own doing all kinds of things preaching in communist countries and in dangerous situations and speaking to government officials and political heads to try and get permissions for certain things and here i am often thinking oh no well you know we've got to set up the situation just right or you know we, we have to be careful about how we preach otherwise or we have to make sure we set up things in just a certain way otherwise and from the strength of our spiritual masters from the strength of our spiritual grandfather this first generation was off doing things that i couldn't even comprehend likewise Prahlad maharaj was doing things that i couldn't even comprehend even at five. And so Gorgovinda Maharaj, when he left New York for, I think about the last time, we were at the airport and I asked him some advice about being serious about Krishna consciousness. And at that time I was about maybe 10 years old myself. And the advice he gave me was, to make my faith strong like Prahlad Maharaj, so, so that it would become unshakable. To make your faith strong like a pillar, so that no one would be able to shake it, to cast stones at it, to chip at its edges, to make it strong like a pillar. And it's a piece of advice that I remember often, usually after the obstacles come in the way and then i wind up thinking why is this happening to me and then the advice kind of comes creeping back in but we we had the goal we were given charge of the the mission to keep our faith strong like Prahlad maharaj so what does that even mean um and i was reading in preparation for this lecture i was reading from Sri Brihad Bhagavatamrita. And I like Brihad Bhagavatamrita so much because it is like sweet rice from the Bhagavatam. Right? Condensed, cooked down nectar churned from the entire Bhagavatam. And once my Guru Maharaj was giving a series of lectures and they wanted him to speak on the entirety of Srimad Bhagavatam. And he said, with such little time, you know, Parikshit Maharaj had seven days of hearing Bhagavatam, but he wasn't eating, he wasn't sleeping, he wasn't drinking, no breaks, right? No bathroom breaks, no nothing. And so he said, what a, what a dis, what an injustice it would be. And first he said, what an injustice it would be for him to say anything about Bhagavatam, much less rushing through the entirety of Srimad Bhagavatam. So he said there wasn't quite enough time for him to do it justice the way he would really like, but there was time for him to speak through just a section of Brihad Bhagavatamrita. And after all, Bhagavatamrita, what is, what is Bhagavatamrita? It is the nectar of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now Brihad because it is big, but still not quite as big as Bhagavatam itself. And so I always remember that whenever I feel like, how do I, how do I traverse an entire, an entire story or, or an entire volume of Srimad Bhagavatam in such a short amount of time? Then I always kind of look to Brihad Bhagavatam Rita for the answers and for some hope. Because it is, it is, it is churned patiently from the essence 
of Srimad Bhagavatam. So we have time to hear a little bit from that that section of, of Srimad Bhagavatam and from Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Uh, turns out that Janava Mata, or Ma Janava, as she was affectionately called by so many of the Gaudiya Vaishnavs that took shelter of her, Janava Mata is the wife of Lord Nityananda. She is known as Nityananda Swarupini, or the, the Shakti, the manifestation of the internal potency of Sri Nityananda Prabhu. And after Lord Nityananda and Mahaprabhu, they wind up their, their earthly pastimes, she becomes the leading Acharya. And so many devotees go and they take shelter of her. And they ask her for initiation and she preaches to them and she goes on many, many pilgrimages and she leads the devotees and she takes care of the devotees, but she cooks for the devotees almost constantly. She loved feeding the devotees and feeding the deities of the different temples that she would go to. And it is said that when she took a pilgrimage to Vrindavan, all of the devotees were so excited that they were kind of speaking about it, whispering about it, excitedly telling one another about it all the way along her journey to Vrindavan. And then when she got there, it was like a buzz. The word went all and spread all throughout Vrindavan. Ma Janava is here. And while she was there, they said she loved hearing the writings of the Goswamis. Particularly, she loved to hear from the pages of Brihad Bhagavatamrita. And when the devotees would read to her, she would cry in ecstasy and she would ask them to read it again and again and again. So this is our connection to Janava Devi. Also, when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spent the, the last about 12 years of his life in Jagannath Puri and Gambira, he would have a daily routine. During that daily routine, he would go to see Gadadhar Pandit. And when he would go and see Gadadhar Pandit for several hours, two, three hours at least, he would hear from him Srimad Bhagavatam. Gadadhar Pandit was so immersed in Bhagavatam that this became his main form of devotional service and worship, along with the worshiping of his deity of Gopinath, who we spoke about before, who was standing, but then after Mahaprabhu finishes his earthly pastimes, even though Gadadhar Pandit was only about 47, he immediately began to wither away like a flower without sunlight, like a night blooming lotus without the moon. Right, we have all these nice poetic analogies, but he began to wither away immediately so that he looked so much older than his bodily age would confer. So he became so immersed in his deity worship, of course, that finally he thought, I can't do this anymore. Better I, I leave the, the worship of Gopinath to someone else. And as we heard miraculously, Gopinath said, I don't want to be worshipped by anyone else. I want to be worshipped by you right here in this garden, this Tota. So this deity is affectionately known as Tota Gopinath. And what he does is this deity is so determined to be worshipped by his devotee that he sits down. Fine, you can't reach me, no problem. I'll meet you halfway. This is our Krishna, who will always meet us halfway. And so, Gorachandra would go and he would sit with Gadadhar Pandit and he would hear Srimad Bhagavatam. And it is stated that when he would hear the story of Prahlad Maharaj, he would ask Gadadhar Pandit after the entirety of the story was spoken, speak it again. No less than 100 times he would hear this story of Prahlad Maharaj before continuing on. This is eagerness. We hear about this greed that we need in order to taste and relish the pastimes and the names of Sri Krishna. So much greed is needed that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself says, Oh my Lord, you have unlimited names. And in each of these names, you have invested all of your internal, external, wonderful, manifested potency. 
And thus you have millions of life-giving names like Krishna and Govinda, but I am so unfortunate that I have no attraction to tasting these names. It's the Lord of our universe speaking. If he has no attraction, what hope is there for me? What, 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 what are we, what, what can I hope for? What can I do if the Supreme Lord himself is saying, but alas, I am so unfortunate that I have no attraction for chanting these names. Uh, this shouldn't bring us to a hopeless conclusion, but a hopeful one. Hopeful because even if the Supreme Lord is saying this, then the Lord expects us to have pitfalls. The Lord is going to expect us to waver. The Lord is going to understand that we are not quite yet like a lamp in a windless place. Strong and determined, our flame fixed at all times. Right? He should know. Well, you already know what you signed up for then, Lord. My determination, my, my faith is going to be wavering. But I can use these devotees as a pole star as a fixed North Star. The name Dhruva itself means fixed, as fixed as the pole star in which he will come to rule over later. And as it so happens, whenever Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would hear the story of Dhruva Maharaj, he would ask Gadadhar Pandit, speak it again, no less than 100 times. Can you imagine if every Akadashi for the next 100 Akadashis, I would just come and speak the same story about the same Vaishnavacharya. And none of us in the, in the Zoom or on YouTube would say, Achita Gopi, what are you doing? Why are we hearing this story again? If everybody was thinking, no, speak it again, no problem. Go back, say that one again. That was a great one. Look at the greatness of our Krishna. Then somehow we'd come to the platform of eagerness, and, and greedy relishing that happened between Gadadhar Pandit and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is our Lord, and this is our goal. These are our aspirations. Of course, maybe not right now, unless some of you are exalted devotees, and I'm sure that some of you are, and I pay my obeisances to all of you. But maybe not right now for most of us. But that can be our goal that Srimad Bhagavatam is not something to simply be read and get over with, right? You know, we have these, these reading challenges and yes, we do want to accomplish the reading of Srimad Bhagavatam, but what if the actual goal is to get to that place where we hear just one story and we think, but I wanna hear it again. I haven't fully memorized to my heart's content what Prahlad Maharaj has said. I haven't fully imbibed to my heart's content the meaning of just one verse. My Guru Maharaj has said that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said that if we can just understand even one word of Bhagavatam perfectly, that will be enough to perfect our lives and take us back to Godhead. So yes, there are innumerable blessings to be received from the reading and the completion of reading Bhagavatam. There are innumerable, innumerable blessings. And I've heard that those blessings are actually a trap. They're a trap specifically designed to get us to hear and read more Bhagavatam. So yes, there are innumerable blessings after every every pastime you hear and for one who hears or recites or reads these pastimes with faith we get so many different benedictions as we do in each ekadashi we have each ekadashi and after the ekadashi story we hear and for one who hears or recites or reads you get the benefit of donating millions of cows taking care of millions of cows in charity, performing this sacrifice and that sacrifice and all of these things that in previous yugas had to be done for thousands of years. And now all we have to do is listen to a story for five minutes with faith and determination in our hearts that this is our Krishna, always working in our favor. 
So for this particular Ekadashi, Mohini Ekadashi, Yudhishthira Maharaj speaks to Sri Krishna and he asks him, can you tell me about this Ekadashi? And then Sri Krishna says, I will tell you the glories of the Ekadashi, just as Vashishta Muni spoke to Sri Ramachandra. Were you wondering how I was going to bring it into the appearance day of Sita Devi? I did it. I did it. So this Ekadashi, uh, Vashishta Muni is speaking to Sri Ramachandra and Ramachandra asks for some advice. He says, oh, great guru, I, I have suffered for so long in the absence of my dear Sita. He says, I've suffered for, for too long. Can you give me some, some remedy for my suffering? Can you tell me how my suffering can be ended? Vashishta Muni says, O oh Lord Ram, O oh you whose intelligence is so keen, simply by remembering your name, one can cross the ocean of the material world. You have questioned me in order to benefit all of humanity and to fulfill everyone's desires. Now I shall describe that day of fasting, which purifies the entire world. And it is with that introduction that Vashishta Muni describes the glories of Mohini Akadashi, the glories of the Akadashi, which falls just today for us. So this is a day which is supposed to soothe us, comfort us, be there for us when we are in times of need and in trouble and in times of obstacle, when our hearts feel overburdened. These stories of the Bhagavatam can give us the greatest solace. These are the stories that are supposed to comfort us. And indeed they do. Sri Krishna likes to hear many, many bedtime stories. And so sometimes he asks his mother for a bedtime story and she'll narrate the pastimes of Sri Ram. And sometimes he'll ask his mother for a very exciting bedtime story. And she will narrate the story of Lord Nishringadev. Which is so wonderful because sometimes she's a little bit of two minds about it. She thinks, I will tell my child this story, but should I tell my child this story? After all, he's a small boy. He might become frightened. The, the story of Lord Nishringadev is quite intense. It's exciting, it's adventurous, but really also it can be very frightening. And after all, my child is the same boy who hears thunder and runs from his chambers to my own and grasps onto my arm and hugs me tightly and holds onto my finger and says, oh Maya, please protect me. Will my child actually be able to sleep if I tell him this story? But she thinks, let me tell the story anyway. So she begins to narrate the story to her little child. Once upon a time, there were great signs that misfortune was coming about. What are the signs that misfortune is coming about? Well, there was blood and pus raining from the skies. Now, for any of you that have been keeping up, I've been sending out news updates, right? So this is like a a weather update, and I feel like a health update all in one. Those are the days. What what does the forecast say for that day? It's like a 50% chance of clouds and also blood and pus. Like, how does that become the precipitation? If any of you are wondering what pus is, first of all, ill. Uh, second of all, you ever you ever go and you get a pimple and then you pop the pimple and there's all like this whitish greenish yellowish viscous disgusting substance that comes out of it that my friends is pus now as if blood was not enough raining from the skies then there's also pus raining from the skies and the question that we've always asked in my family is who is cleaning this up? Like all glories to the street sweepers, because what? Do you have like a special umbrella for that? Like what happens? Because I am in the mood of really, really accepting 
these, these Vedic histories as histories. And so there's no way that my mind can even compute an analogy for that. Like, you know, some people are like, oh, I can't take it literally. It's figuratively. It's like, oh, figurative for what? Because raining cats and dogs means it's raining really hard, but raining blood and pus, what is that even figurative for? There is no way. It has to be literal. And if it is literal, what do you do in this situation? How do you get rid of it? It just, it seems like a really deplorable and uncomfortable and disgusting situation for everyone involved. But this, this is what heralded the birth of the twin sons of Kashyapamuni, Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. If at any point there were twins born and there was any kind of phenomenon like that, I, I would really think that we all need to like have an exit strategy for the earth immediately. We need to go. There's something there that we can't stay here. But this is what heralded the birth of Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. These two twin sons were born and as demons do, because they were not born in the, in the usual way, uh, from usual parentage, they grow up quite quickly. They don't have the same like growing and gestational period that humans do because they're not human. They are certified daityas. They are the sons of Diti. Uh, and so they grow up quite quickly and they begin to wreak havoc all over the earth. In fact, Hiranyaksha has wreaked so much havoc over the earth that he winds up pushing the earth down into the causal ocean. And it has to be rescued by a very wonderful incarnation of our Supreme friend by the name of Varaha. Comes in the form of a boar. And while I was in India, there were lots of, so many wild pigs and you saw, you see like a boar or two. And when you see like a boar or two, we were excitedly pointing it out. Like, look, there's a boar, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. Uh, and, and they're kind of just, they were kind of doing their thing rummaging, looking for all kinds of things. And that's why they say that the Lord takes this form as a boar. Boars are very good for searching out things in unusual places. And there were so many unusual places. And because they were hot, some of them were just kind of like laying out half in the, half in this, the, the open sewer, half out, trying to find some way to like cool off in the, in the heat. And some of them were tiny little baby ones. Uh, which we were all very strangely excited to see because they were kind of cute, like little, cute little baby pigs. And they're all, everybody just kind of like running around doing their thing. But so our Lord takes the form of a boar. And my Guru Maharaj says, you know, you don't normally compare somebody to a pig if they are smart and sweet and good looking and filled with all kinds of good qualities, isn't it? It's not normally a thing unless you're a weirdo like me. And then, you know, they're all adorable. They're sweet. But this is because I've grown up with the idea of Varahadev, who has brought glory to the entire lineage and species of boars and pigs. So he says, normally you compare someone if they're sloppy or they're messy or they're dirty. Even one time Mother Yashoda looks at Krishna, he's covered head to toe in mud. Right? All that's really visible that might kind of be clean as his peacock feather. There's mud in his hair, there's mud all over his face. So much so that even to open his eyes, he's got to clear some away and then open his eyes. And then all you see, you don't see blue anymore. He's just covered with mud. She says, oh, la la, why are you so restless? Why are you always covered in mud and dirt and all of everything that covers the ground of Vrindavan? Why? Were you some sort of pig in your last life that you must be covered like this? And she thinks this is motherly scolding. Krishna internally answers the question, yes. Yes, I was. He's proud. He's proud of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I was. Externally, Mother Yashoda cannot figure out why 
why her son is like this. But just like Krishna, we can we can follow that that gentle, simple advice. Roll in the dust. Do it. Feels great. I guarantee you it's a really wonderful experience. Do it. It's so much fun. So this is Varaha. And my Guru Maharaj says, anyone who doesn't have faith in these stories, who's not looking at these stories with faith, happens to be the most unfortunate, unintelligent person to grace the entire universe. This was back before my Guru Maharaj became the, the, the sweet teller of sweet pastimes that he is now. Right In the previous lecture, sometimes he got intense. He would tell the people like it is. Now we have what is referred to when you when you get parents, right? You've got the parents who are the parents of the first set of kids. And then you got the parent who's the parent of the middle child and the younger children. And those kids usually have it easier. And then when they become grandparents, you're like, oh, you kids don't know what parents are. The parents that I had are so different from the grandparents that my 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 nephews and my children and everybody see now. So same with our, our spiritual masters. Sometimes we can see at the beginning, they were like the, the first generation parents. Now they've become really sweet, really nurturing, super tender. So he was saying, you know, these, these people who are not looking at these stories with faith, not understanding that as a boar, which is not normally seen as the most beautiful creature in creation, when the Lord takes the form of a boar, first he's still the Lord, Right? Then just so happens to be also a boar, which means he is the most beautiful, enchanting form that anyone has ever seen. People were bowing down, falling in love, all kinds of looking at this boar, feeling complete peace. Anytime he would open his mouth and make a noise, it sounded like the chanting of all of the Vedas. He had lotus eyes glittering tusks can we even imagine what an adorable sight this must have been reddish prickling hairs all over his body but this is our lord this is the most beautiful beautiful sight anyone has ever beheld and so this is the the form of our lord who did away with hiranyaksha hiranyakashipu was quite upset at the death of his twin brother. After all, what kind of inhuman, horrible person would just kill one twin? You ever think about that, right? You've got twins, they've been together this entire time. You separate the twins, it's almost like an injustice to society. What kind of person would do this? This is Vishnu. This entire universe is worshiping this Vishnu. Now, put yourself in Hiranyakashipu's shoes. If somebody had killed your twin brother, you'd feel like, I want revenge. After all, he was just doing what he was doing. He challenged you rightfully to a fight. And then you go and you kill him? It's ridiculous. And so Hiranyakashipu consoles his own mother and the wife of, uh, of Hiranyaksha with very learned words, actually. He spoke so many things that are shastrically true. And then he makes a plan to kill Vishnu. He says, all of these brahmanas, these cows, these are the, the limbs of Vishnu that give him the foundation with which to cheat us demons out of everything we hold dear. Let us attack these brahmans and these cows because that will really hit Vishnu where it hurts. So he begins attacking brahmanas and cows and all kinds of saintly people, sacrifices, everything must go. And as fate would have it, Hiranyakashipu has a child named Prahlad. And from the very womb, this Prahlad Maharaj has been hearing the pastimes of Lord Vishnu from none other than Narada Muni, who of course Narada Muni was going to get involved in this pastime and on the side that would make the demons the most angry. And so Prahlad Maharaj, as he emerges even from the womb, he's called Prahlad, which means he's like bright as the first light of the sun, illuminating not only 
and an entire family, but an entire dynasty, an entire generation of people. He is still illuminating us even today. And Narada Muni becomes the guru for Prahlad Maharaj. Later within the pages of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, he rushes. Brihad Bhagavatam Rita says he goes running to the city of demons to go and speak with his disciple Prahlad Maharaj. And he tells him, you are the recipient of the Lord's mercy. I am now speaking with the true recipient of all of the Lord's mercy. After all, you were just five years old. The Lord took a form never before seen just to protect you from your own father. And I'll be telling this story for days to come. And so any part that we are missing today, keep stay tuned because in the coming days, we'll just be repeating the story again and again and again, hoping to give joy to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he says, you've been saved. And even after you were saved, the Lord was so angry that he ignored everybody else and all he did was pay attention to you. You were saved from so many injustices. This is the part where I always think about Gorgovinda Maharaj saying, make your faith strong like Prahlad Maharaj so that no one can shake it. What was Prahlad Maharaj's faith? He was hurled off a cliff by his father. And he had the wherewithal to simply keep chanting and remembering the Supreme Person. And he was saved from what would look like certain death. He was thrown into the ocean, cast to the bottom of the ocean, which is a lot. And then as a contingency plan, Hiranyakashipu puts a mountain on top. Like just in case he happens to like try and float to the top. Let's put a mountain on top. And this to me always seemed like overkill, right? Like getting a blowtorch for like the smallest, minutest or, or combating a fly with a bat and not just an American bat, like a cricket bat, right? Like, like nice wide surface. You're like, you don't really need, do you need all of that? And so simultaneously, I'm also asking, but do you need all that? He's five. It's a small boy. But Hiranyakashipu was not taking any chances, but Prahlad happened to continue to be saved. And Prahlad Maharaj, throughout all of these things, his father fed him poison. His father put him up against all of the most intense rakshasas and witches and all of these beings who are very fond of eating small children. And Prahlad Maharaj was saved each time. And never did Prahlad Maharaj ask, why would my Lord treat me like this? Oh Lord, you are in charge of everything. You are the source of all that be. Why are you treating me like this? This is Prahlad Maharaj's faith. This is the faith that we can aspire to just make strong. This is strength of character. This is unflinching faith. One time, my Guru Maharaj was asked a question. Oh, Guru Maharaj, why is it that we are not given the ability to remember all of our past lives? We've seen so many great souls from the pages of Bhagavatam are able to remember their past lives. Oh, Guru Maharaj, why not me? My Guru Maharaj gave the answer. We can't handle the trauma of this one life. Can you imagine if we were burdened with the trauma of an unlimited amount of lifetimes? We'd be unable to function. Is that we can't function in this one life with this one little bit of trauma. And today we love the word trauma. Goes right in neck and neck with the word toxic. All right, we're so eager to put trauma on everything. Oh, I've been traumatized. Oh no, I've been triggered. I'm traumatized. I have so much trauma. I can't function. I can't do this. All right? We are really, we've fallen in love with the, with the trauma. We, we lack all fortitude, to be quite honest. As a species, as this modern day human species, we lack all fortitude. The minute any amount of trauma comes, the minute the thought of trauma comes the minute we see something 
that could possibly be traumatizing to someone else. We get so deeply within our feelings that we cease to be able to function possibly for the rest of that day, possibly for the rest of the next day too, right? We retire to our beds, that's it. We need our smelling salts, we can't function. Can you imagine us trying to function with the trauma of lifetimes? I've had people who have asked me, well, maybe, maybe don't tell that story because it's traumatizing. Prahlad Maharaj had to live this story. What do you mean don't tell it? The least we could do is honor Prahlad Maharaj's sacrifice and his struggle by telling his story constantly. And sometimes now we're wondering, well, maybe that's going to be really traumatizing. Maybe the form of Lord Nishringadev himself is going to be traumatizing to some people. So maybe we don't want to lead them into it gently. It was traumatizing for this five-year-old boy. Can you imagine if any of our parents had treated us anything like Hiranyakashipu treated Prahlad Maharaj? We would be crying toxicity and trauma from the rooftops to anyone who would listen. We would be screaming abuse immediately. Prahlad Maharaj doesn't do any of this. None of it. All he does is remember his Supreme Lord and then thank him for his mercy when he's saved. Prahlad Maharaj does not go into it with a sense of entitlement, like, I deserve to be saved. Like, Lord, where were you? Why didn't you come five minutes ago? Why did I have to be cast off the mountain in order for you to save me? Why couldn't you have just saved me before I was cast off the mountain? Why couldn't you have just done away with the, with the many demons before they even got to be casting me off the mountain? Why did I even have to feel a sliver of fear? Prahlad Maharaj does not say any of that. In fact, what he says is, for any of us who have entered this material world, we are always going to be embarrassed by the obstacles that come our way. He preaches again and again and again to his father, to his classmates, to anyone who will listen, that this is the effect of being in the material world. This is what this material existence is like. Whether internally or externally, we are always being cast off of mountains. We are being pitted against all kinds of demonic forces, whether outside or even within our own mind. We are being assailed and assaulted by these depressive thoughts, which are just like demons trying to rob our peace. We are being affected by our minds, which want to try and chew that which has already been chewed, right? Everybody's one of their, their favorite lines from Prahlad Maharaj. At five years old, he's coming up with these wonderful analogies. Right? We're constantly trying to look for all of this, all of this juice, this sweetness from a fruit that is not sweet by nature. The fruit of this material world is not sweet by nature. And if some sweetness happens to come, then that is somehow a blessing. And yet we think we are entitled to the sweetness and the happiness. So much so that when it doesn't come, we blame our supreme friend. Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you save me sooner? Never understanding, never coming to the realization, the hard won realization that it is up to us. We have made the decision to try and enjoy separate from our Krishna. And so then we needed a place where we could enjoy separate from our Krishna. So we have this place where enjoyment is actually just suffering in disguise. Because later on we find out, oh, I guess I wasn't really enjoying the, th the whole thing. And we see it. We are trying. There's an itch, you scratch it and then it bleeds and then you think, oh, that was terrible. And then the skin heals back and then it itches again and then you scratch it again and then it bleeds again. Chewing that which has already been chewed. We've done this for lifetimes. We've been doing this for lifetimes. When will we desire something else? This is Prahlad Maharaj at five saying, when will I desire something else? 
When will I desire to worship Krishna instead of trying to serve my senses, which for lifetimes has not worked? This is Prahlad Maharaj's faith. Never blaming his friend. And instead looking, how can I take the most accountability for everything that is happening to me? How can I take the most responsibility? Bhakti Chirta Maharaj said a sign of true love is by accountability and responsibility. A sign of love, the hallmark of a sign of real love is looking at how much accountability and responsibility we personally are willing to take and accept. The more love we have, the more responsibility we are willing to take. Which is the opposite of today. If I love you, that means that I'm like taking as little accountability and responsibility as humanly possible. And I'm putting all of the onus on you. It's up to you to show up for this relationship. It's up to you to show up in my life. And also how you treat me as a reflection of you. And if you're upset with me, then you really need to get in touch with your own triggers and find out exactly what's happening with you because this has nothing to do with me. Where when we see with divine love and spiritual and devotional service, it's the complete opposite. How can I serve you? Ooh, what have I done? Oh no, this person is having a breakdown. How have I contributed to this? Maybe I said something. Maybe I did something that made this person uncomfortable. Let me pray. So Prahlad Maharaj is, is the complete other end of the spectrum. I have put myself in this deplorable condition. And now all I can do is hope that my Supreme friend will have causeless mercy on me because I have a causeless unwillingness to serve is how my mom used to put it. So all I can hope is that my Supreme friend will have causeless mercy upon me and save me from this deplorable condition that is still my fault. I don't deserve it. In fact, this was my fault. In fact, my Supreme friend said, don't go there. Don't leave me, don't go. And I decided anyway, I'm going, that's it. So all of this was brought about by my decisions, by my heart, by my, my, my own faulty reasoning. Now all I can hope for is that my Supreme friend will have causeless mercy upon me and save me anyway. And they do. They never let us down. They do save us anyway. These are the lessons from the boy Prahlad Maharaj who was ruling even before he was made king. He was making devotees with determination, with patience. And there was one, just one section of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita in a purport that really impressed upon me the glory of Prahlad Maharaj. In the purport, Gopi Paranadana Prabhu says, Sri Hari Bhakti Sudadaya states, Upon hearing his brilliant words, this is everyone who would listen to Prahlad Maharaj. Upon hearing his brilliant words, some people felt an extraordinary sense of detachment from material life and began to shed tears. Others who saw him responded by bowing down to him. Others were amazed to see him playfully laugh and simply stood in groups watching him. All these persons were relieved of worldly contamination. Prahlad Maharaj delivered ordinary people, not only by freeing them from unhappiness, but also by giving them the highest happiness of pure devotional service to Lord Vishnu. Sound like Srila Prabhupada to anybody else? Because that's what I thought of as soon as I read it. This is our, this is our grandfather. This is our spiritual father. This is our Srila Prabhupada. Anyone, upon hearing his brilliant words, some people felt an extraordinary sense of detachment from material life. Some began to shed tears. Others began to perform superhuman activities. They would open temples, meet famous people, impress upon the hearts of famous people the glory of worshiping Sri Krishna. 
They would speak to people that they would never be speaking to otherwise. Not only would they speak to them, but they would somehow convince them about the wonders and the glory of Krishna consciousness. Anyone who heard Srila Prabhupada was relieved of their suffering. Just like anyone who heard from Prahlad Maharaj was relieved of their suffering. So as we speak about people who made their faith as strong as Prahlad Maharaj, this is Srila Prabhupada. And we can see what happens to a person who makes their faith that strong. No matter what obstacles come their way, Tate Nukampam Shushamikshamano, oh my Lord, this is coming about by your causeless mercy. Anything that comes my way, good or bad, is your causeless mercy because only you know what I deserved. Only you know how much worse I've deserved. Who knows what abominable things I've done in any lifetime? I've forgotten, but you have not. And not only did you not give me as much as I deserve, but you're saving me from my current situation. You're protecting me. Whatever I've gotten now was just a fraction. And Srimad Bhagavatam says that for one who has this mindset, for one who is able to see our Supreme Friend in this merciful manifestation, pure, devo pure devotional service, and their place within the spiritual realm has already been set. It's been claimed. It becomes their birthright. Then we become entitled to all of the Lord's mercy. That's what happens when we make our faith strong like Prahlad Maharaj. So um, I do understand that when these reversals come upon us, we are not able to simply look at them and not complain or not have anything to say about it. So yeah, gather in groups together. Gather with like-minded devotees and then reveal your heart. I'm going through these reversals and obstacles and I'm not, I am not realized enough to, to, to go through it without complaining. I need that place to complain and vent and express all my ideas about my trauma. But then be in that same assembly of devotees who can uplift us and say, but do we remember Prahlad Maharaj? Do we remember what he went through? Not to say somebody always has it worse than us, but also to say that our Vaishnavacharyas understand what we're going through and more. In fact, we cannot understand the depth of suffering. Just let us remember Prahlad Maharaj and be uplifted, thinking if the Supreme Lord saved Prahlad Maharaj, of course he will save us too. If our Supreme Person had causeless mercy for Prahlad Maharaj, of course he'll have causeless mercy for us. And in this way, we can turn our suffering into the greatest devotional service simply by remembering our Supreme Lord just as Prahlad Maharaj did. And for one who remembers these stories and hears these stories, we receive the same benefits that are given to these great personalities. All we have to do is a little bit of reading, a little bit of remembering, a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of gathering together each Akadashi to hear the glories of these pastimes again and again and again. Over a hundred times we could say, say it again, speak it again. So I thank you so much for allowing me to strengthen my faith one more day, one more morning to, to get up early and make my Ikadashi fruitful, to take shelter of Ikadashi Devi, who is always there to bless us, to relieve us of our suffering, to soothe our own hearts. So thank you so much for being with me. Thank you very much, Achuta Gopi Devi Prabhu for making our faith unflinching on this Ikadashi. We look forward to your classes for, for all the upcoming Ikadashis, hundreds and hundreds of them. We like your graphic descriptions. We like how you flip, flip the script. You know, pigs are cute. Yeah, we like it. They're so <laughs> cute though, they're really cute. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much.
Yeah, we can't. Krishna is always working in our favor. That's my takeaway personally. And would anyone else like to share what they liked? What stuck with them? Bhima Prabhu says in the chat, it's a very, very beautiful prayer that he does. Dear Lord, why couldn't you have just saved me before I was cast off the mountain? This is his prayer. Yeah. yeah. Don't we all find ourselves in that situation? It's like, oh, but Lord, why did this have to happen in the first place? You're the cause of all causes. You are time. You could go back in time. Make it so that I never had any inconveniences to begin with. Somehow this wasn't for Lod. Although sometimes it was the mood of the cowherd boys. And that's what I like about about Vrindavan, right? All of the awe and the majesty is taken, stripped away. And here now we have cowherd boys who are saying, Krishna, we're your own people, save us. And why didn't you save us sooner? Yeah. Who will catch me while I'm falling? Bhima is asking. Achita Gopi will save you in the morning class crew, Bhima Prabhu. We'll be there for you, don't worry. Don't worry, Krishna is there for you. Okay, today is Akadashi, so um, nothing in, nothing out. And uh, increase, let's increase our hearing about Krishna, who is always working in our favor, and let's decrease our causeless unwillingness to serve, as mm. the Gopi's mom puts it. I like it. That's a very, that's that's a good one. Take away. Beautiful class. Thanks, says Hemangi. Bhima Prabhu says he's saved. Kartik says, thank you for the wonderful class. Andrea says, I think it go, uh, it's uh, about pus. She says, so, oh. And Bhima says the same thing. <laughs> no, really, yeah. I, I, I need to know, like, do you have, like, do you go out that day covered in Neosporin? Like, what do you do? Such a, an interesting situation to be in with a weather forecast like that. Yeah. Plus, okay, thank you very much. And she said, we'll bound down to you. You wear a mask, we must say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, bowing down to you, all the people listening online, uh, on YouTube. We love you all. Hari Bol, thanks for participating in this Sangha regularly. Hari Krishna. Hi. Hare Krishna, Chita Gopi. Thank you so much. Hari Bol.